Professor Bielinski, you are the things are not that simple. Uh, ah, I, didn't say, I didn't say simple. I said uh, general relativity is not linear. Absolutely, it's absolutely true. Uh, uh, the talk is a part of, uh, of uh, a project uh, which is being realized here uh, called the role of small scale homogeneity in general relativity and cosmology funded by the Foundation of Polish Science. Let me begin by, uh, by the outline of my talk. So first, I will, uh, as, as an introduction, I will discuss the, the problem of nonlinearity of general relativity and how it matters. Um, in particular, I will discuss set, certain types of um, nonlinearity, that is the non-additivity of masses in GR, and astrophysical consequences. I will then present the main topic of my talk, that is, uh, thing I call the multi-scale solution, which has certain paradoxical properties, which may challenge very naive <coughs> expectations as to when the nonlinear effects of GR matter or not. And finally, I will talk about the applications of this result to cosmology and astrophysics. So let me begin by reviewing the Einstein's equations, the, the field equations of general relativity, and their Newtonian counterpart, the Poisson equation for a for the scalar potential of the gravitational field. Well, there are obviously many differences between these two equations. Um, these equations are tensorial in nature. They involve a, a 4 by 4 symmetric tensor. Uh, whereas this, is, this equation is obviously scalar. Uh, moreover, this equation is an equation on a fixed flat, flat background. We imagine that we've got a background metric, background structure which is fixed. And the Laplacian structure with respect to the structure. This is not the case here where there is no outside structure. Everything we, we all the equations refer only to the metric, which is at the same time the variable we solve for. Um, and the equations are covariant in the sense that they are they're truly tensorial in nature. Um, and finally, what I want to focus on is the observation that the Poisson equation is obviously linear, whereas this equation is not. It's not obviously visible from, from this thing, but uh, just believe me that this thing here, the Einstein tensor, is a complicated nonlinear function of G, uh, its inverse, and its first and second derivatives. Uh, if the equations are not linear, then of course we cannot use, for example, the superposition principle to, to produce uh, uh, solutions corresponding to multiple sources, or at least we can't do it in general. In certain special cases we can, but not in general. Um, one of the most striking effects of nonlinearity of GR, although of course not the only one, is the fact that if we take two masses, uh, two objects with, with masses n1, n2, uh, by masses I mean something measured uh, close to these, to these masses, uh, let's say we, we, we put an astronaut right here on the surface of this object, measure the uh, size of this object, measure the, uh, measure the the uh, acceleration uh, induced by the gravitational field, we do it here and here, in fact that the masses are equal to m1 and m2. But on the other hand, we can also measure the total mass of the system by going very far away and trying to capture the subtle effects of, of these two masses on, let's say, um, other bodies passing by. And it will turn out that this mass measured at infinity is in general not equal to the sum of these two masses. There are no linear corrections. How big those differences might be? Uh, this is not exact. Well, it depends but how far you are. This is a consequence of, of the uh, equation which is usually considered as a symbol of general relativity, which sometimes is written with c squared, but I use the units in which c is equal to 1. So let me Therefore, if there is an interaction, then there must be Energy of interaction. You can express it differently. Gravitational field by itself also contains some energy, and this this energy also gravitates. So uh, different gravitational fields correspond to slightly different masses. 
Okay, so let me focus on a special case, but in the same sense of the astronaut sits on the star or the mass number one, he was not only measuring the bare mass of the planet one, because it also interacts with the rest. So the mass that individual measures on the planet is not what will be the mass of the planet in otherwise completely empty universe. Uh, not quite. If you, if you yeah, the, by the same argument as Professor Kioski, but the I repeated the argument no. of Professor Kioski. But the so astronaut is treated the, here as a negligible mass. No, no, not astronaut. But if I have a mass, the argument of Professor Kioski was that if there are two masses, then there is interaction. Yeah. Therefore, this equation tells that the, that the masses are not added. So that, that I buy, <laughs> and I assume it's, So now if I have the two planets, and there is a one planet, and the astronaut of negligible mass sits on that planet, and thus whatever which measures the mass of that planet, it also contains a contribution from the other. Yes, but think Maybe that extremely small, but we are not it's talking not about It's not only small, but it can actually cancels each other out if you think that the, the other planet is not standing still. It's moving in the gravitational field. It's falling but in the gravitational field. But it's not field. moving in this equation. It's a completely, but this, completely but I, identity. Okay. First of all, are we talking about the Newtonian gravity or full relativity? Because these are two different things. This equation has nothing to do with Newton. Uh, yes, what I'm saying okay, is that in the Newtonian theory, you just have perfect additive in those masses. You don't have it in yeah, well, yeah, that was a side comment. Sorry. OK, so let me focus on a special case. I will just look at the initial data of the, for the Einstein equations, which means I'm looking at the universe at a given uh, moment of time. I see how a three-dimensional surface, which is the constant time surface. Uh, and then there is a special answer, it's very well known in relativity, in which you assume that the extrinsic curvature of, of, uh, of the surface vanishes, which basically means that at the moment of we are looking at, there, there, there are no motions or no changes. So this is the external curvature of this Constant to the time. Yeah. Exactly. And then I also assume that the metric tensor can be written down as the flat tensor times a conformal factor. So the metric tensor will be now Q. Yes, because it's a three dimensional tensor, <coughs> metric tensor, only living on this free space. Uh, the point is that any metric tensor can be thought of as an object which does two things. First of all, it measures angles, and secondly, it measures distances. And the thing is that you can, in a way, decouple these two things. It's not easy to, to do it on the level of, of matrices, but you can do it. And it turns out that uh, decomposing these two things is very so easy. So the, the, this, this assumption means that this three-dimensional cut is a fluid. Sorry, that what's a fluid? Well, because if the, if, uh, if the metric tensor is a delta times some number, uh, some function, that means it doesn't have a shear constant, so it's, it's only a compressible. Not moment. It's not an energy moment. It's not a no, 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 it's a metric tensor. I mean, the metric tensor measures elastic properties of this thing. So it, 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 it is a kind of a dust or fluid or whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say so. It's just an assumption for the, for the form of this metric tensor. That yeah, but I mean, I'm asking about the physical. I will, we will get I don't believe there is any physics. At the moment, it's just an assumption. What it is, is a what uh, is that? computationally. It's a three dimensional <coughs> object. Yeah. No, it's <coughs> this, this universe, it's right? Universe. Which is a kind of a matter. No, no, no. It's ether. It's ether. Thank you. No, I'm drinking tea. This is geometry. This is just it has nothing to do with the energy moment or whatever. This is just pure job. <coughs> I'm sorry, it's just an assumption concerning what the field looks like. You can assume that the electric field is proportional to the But could I get a different assumption, assuming it's a psi to the, well, since we don't know what is psi, then the psi to the fourth is irrelevant, uh, right? It's not. This is not just well, the we don't have the 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 Sorry. Uh, it is relevant yeah, because you get the simple the equations all in this way. Okay. Ah, the power of four. It's a very easy thing. Four is your simplified. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I would like to continue. 
actually the power of power is important here because otherwise you don't get a simple equation. The thing is that if you plug this back into the Einstein equations, you get a relation between the uh, the energy content of the of the universe and this function psi. And with a different power here, you don't get a simple relation. That's it. Okay, I want to focus now on a special case where we have. Uh, where we have vacuum and a body with it's constant it's density. Of a given radius. This is the, the type of solution I want to look at at the moment. But the thing is that even on, on the, at the level of this one single uh, blob of matter, you can you can see the nonlinear effects of GR. Namely, you can calculate the total mass of this thing in two ways. First of all, you can just uh, integrate the local energy density at each point with the volume form to get the, let's say, total mass, which we understand as the uh, sum of the masses of the constituents. Here, the constituent is, 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 a, is uh, something continuous, so we need to take it. But this, this block is this whole three dimensional kind of. Okay, so you're making a physical, physical assumption. It's not the empty space. Or uh, it's if, a if you paid attention to my previous slide, you would notice yeah. that. This is a constant. Yeah, is a and that was really something the physical, yeah. and moreover, some computational ansatz. Which but I, I understand, but if the density of the button is constant, then my question is constant inside the sphere. The elasticity of well, that is constant. That means that this is fluid because no, 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 because uh, no, no, because the geometry still having uh, dust, the ge three-dimensional geometry could be much more complicated. It is just uh, an ansatz for initial data. Okay. Uh, there is another way to calculate the total mass, namely to go very far away and try to measure the Newtonian pull on, exerted on, on the body put here. This way, we obtain something called the ADM mass. Uh, and it turns out that these two masses are, in general, not equal. Uh, in fact, you can express what I would call the mass deficit. <laughs> The difference between the total mass and the ADM mass, and then I, I, I very much like uh, dimensionless numbers, so I divide this again by the ADM mass. It turns out that this uh, correction is proportional to this combination of uh, quantities: the mass, the gravitational constant, and the and R, which is the size of, of, of this body. Uh, I'm working in in. Uh, so that is the ratio of the Schwarzschild's radius to the pretty much, except that you, you have to you need to write a two here to get exactly the, the Schwarzschild radius. But that's pretty much the same thing. It's a dimensionless number which gives you, which tells you in a way how much general the nonlinear effects of GR matter. To what extent you are you are able to describe your system using Newton's equations and how large the relativistic corrections would be. And this isn't it a Newtonian gravitational potential on the surface, or something like that. Uh, yes. The, the constant density. Yes. Yes, and we will get to it in a second. Yes. Uh, but for the time being, it's just a dimensionless uh, constant which tells you uh, how relativistic this, this object is. And indeed, the relativistic correction is proportional to this epsilon with a fixed. So, for instance, if uh, r goes to infinity, I uh, know this is r of. This is the size of the Okay, so let me go back to the field equations you get uh, with the ansatz I assumed from, from the Einstein's equations. Uh, you get a nonlinear equation in which you have the Laplacian of this psi is equal to minus pg, the density, and then you've got the fifth power of psi, a nonlinear part. But then it turns out that if this thing is small, then you can write psi as, as you can linearize this equation around a constant solution equal to 1. It turns out that with this, from the, this thing being very close to 0, this part is very small. But wait, wait, but 1 is not a solution of this equation. The left hand side is uh, 0, and the right hand side is. OK, you will linearize it uh, assuming that rho is equal to 0. Ah. It's no, a more subtle limit. Of course, of course. Outside of the body, of course, inside it is a very complicated okay. But outside of the body, this is a solution because it's just a... 
And the, only, the whole point is that if you, if you, if you <coughs> linearize you, this equation using phi, you arrive exactly at the Poisson equation. So this is a way to derive the Newtonian limit for, for, for this case. And it is exactly valid when this combination of, of parameters goes to zero. By the way, this combination jump uh, pops up in, in many places in relativity. Also, for example, when you analyze the geodesic Cervantes function metric, and if if this thing is small, then you can you can also use the the, the, the standard Newtonian equations to get the uh, properties of the of the bodies around the uh, the properties of the geodesics around the Schwarzschild metric. So this is something which tells you how relativistic your your system is. No, but is it consistent in counting the powers of epsilon? Because you showed that. The, 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 the mass deficit is of the order of epsilon, mm -hmm. the, the relative mass deficit. Uh, I wonder if somebody noticed that. The thing is that you need to, uh, that in a way, the, the true parameter of, of the expansion. Now you have arrived at the Newtonian gravitation in which suddenly the mass at infinity is just the integral of the density inside, right? Okay, the Whatever thing is. Whatever way you measure it. Kind of the thing is that the real uh, parameter which you need to do in this expansion is, is the square root of. Side. So this is already so this is already so this is already a quadratic factor. quadratic term. Okay. But when r goes to zero, for instance, well, then what happens? It sign goes tends to infinity. Uh, so basically, yes, and this means that we are we are passing through this function. Right. That's right. Yeah. The effects are no longer linear. Uh, so obviously, in this case, you uh, so if epsilon goes to zero. Uh, you cannot use this approximation anymore, yeah. and this function is much more complicated. I can show what you are if you want to it. If you go with that to zero, yeah, yeah, okay. M. Yeah, yeah, because it doesn't work. This you can, you can derive work. this function exactly. I can show you later what it looks like. It's rather complicated, but this is the leading order term. Okay, so let's have a look at this uh, ratio in a few situations for, for the air. It's equal to the surface of the air. Pretty much, but, uh, but, but R is, is, in my language, the size of the body. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is basically more or less the gravitational potential on the surface of the body. Yeah. And so, our derivative of 10 to minus 9 uh, on, on Earth, 10 to minus 8 on the Sun, and 10 to minus 5 for the whole galaxy. So in principle, it's a rather small number. So you might think that relativity, in fact, matters very little in these systems. Because at least the simple power counting, uh, uh, the, the, the simple argument where you just calculate the, the dimensional parameter which parameterizes the, uh, the size of the relativistic effects is equal Yes, uh, C is equal to 1. So there is a C point. I missed the point because I called that whole Thank you. Uh, OK, let's go. So, you may ask whether we need to care about general relativity at all uh, if these questions are so small. Okay, so I now I want to. Uh, so I want to present a very special solution of the Einstein equations, which has several paradoxical properties, but its construction is a bit complicated. So it will take me some time. So let's go back to the uh, to the to the same solution we started from, which is vacuum outside and has a constant density inside. Uh, <coughs> it will be constructed in the following way. I assume that outside, the metric tensor is exactly the Schwarzschild. Uh, uh, it's given exactly by the Schwarzschild solution with, uh, uh, with mass m, right here. Whereas inside, the solution is just given by the metric of a perfect three-dimensional sphere. Uh, with a given radius. This is a met the metric of a free sphere. And it turns out that you can actually match these two metrics together, uh, which means that from your Schwarzschild metric you drill uh, a, a, a ball. Uh, you take also a, a, a cup taken from a free, free sphere, and then you try to match them. Matching means simply that the uh, area of, of, of the sphere as measured by the metric outside and inside should coincide. And also, the derivative uh, of, of the radius of a sphere in the normal direction, as measured by the first metric and the second metric, is the same. And, and the standard, standard assumption of rho is equal to constants is crucial to the whole yes. thing. 
Oh. But um, I had a problem with it, which I believe is the same a problem as what is the rigid body the relativity theory. Namely, how come that anybody can have a constant density when it's very thin, gravity? This, um, is the in, this is the initial condition. It will evolve, of course, in time. It's just a simple. Okay, yeah. I want to present a special funding and model which has very special this properties. Is, this is the solution of the constraints. Right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So we can use you this describe that as a good the initial condition. Initial conditions that what happens yeah. later yeah. is not our problem. problem. Okay. <laughs> then the is second Einstein's problem. The thing is that in the second step, I can do something similar. Namely, inside this full sphere, I can drill a number of holes, as many as I want, as long as they, they don't interfere with each other. But Mikoyo, I understand what is misleading here. You write solution. It is not a solution. It is just initial. Well, yeah, but that's my problem. No, that no is, solution. That is no solution. No, 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 uh, a metric derived from, uh, taken from a full sphere. So, <coughs> what I have created here is is, uh, is a solution which corresponds to the vacuum outside, that is the origin of constant density, but inside also we have a, a, a number of voids which are then filled by over dense regions. And the beautiful thing is that you can do can make this, this consistent. Uh, the matching conditions tell you exactly what kind of uh, Schwarzschild method you have to put here and uh, how big mass you need to, to put inside of these, these uh, over But the even in initial conditions, are you making an assumption that the electric tensor for this mass, the over that that's uh, porous medium, is also qij is equal to some function times delta ij? Uh, you can do it this way, but I don't. So in a way, okay. Because uh, the problem I, I is that like previously you described the uh, boundary uh, conditions in a perfectly uh, symmetric. symmetric case. And now everything is depends now on the distribution function. Therefore, therefore no, no, no. no. Um, everything depends on the distribution function. Of the of the of these two regions, I mean, this is a uh, uh, and and, so, well, and we have to make an assumption concerning the distribution function. No, this well, is because a the because the, the the system is complete. I may invent the at, the, at the, the moment. So this is this is what it looks like at the moment. There is no matter outside, and the yeah. spectrum spectrum is symmetric. But of course, the, 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 there is a distribution of voids inside. And the metric of the whole thing will depends on that distribution. Yes, yes, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. The and that's the beauty of this construction. It doesn't. Look, the thing is that this over this region compensates completely for the void here. So you make an assumption about the distribution. You choose uh, the distribution no, of this in region very specific in a very specific way. So why do you say no? Yes. You have to make a very specific <laughs> distribution. Yes. And, more and, more and moreover, you make an assumption that this bluish matter in outside has a very special property yeah. because that your distribution yes, yes, is yes. not uh, not no, compatible don't in don't forget that this is a construction of a very specific initial I'm just data. trying to understand initial what data. is the physics in yeah. those data uh, uh, the not the physics that you've got because I have to focus in the other so this is the toy model yeah. It is, yeah, yeah, it's a model. But okay. I, but okay. even some toy models made in China are prohibited by law. So okay. I, mean, okay. I, I don't know that okay. this is what I'm asking. Is this toy model? Well, right? I think you is said completely straightforwardly what the model looks like. I don't see yeah. any yes. problem, okay. any unclear point. Okay. No, no, but I have an unclear point, uh, which roughly maybe I understand, but. Uh, what uh, is not so easy is to, how do you specify the uh, 
uh, geometry, the three geometry inside. I understand that it's k is always zero. It's a sphere. It's a metric of a free sphere. What you have inside is a metric of a free sphere. All but then the, uh, the boundary conditions will not no, be. No, no. They will be exactly fulfilled. <laughs> yes, you can. You can. I will show it on a nicer picture in a few minutes. Okay. After everything works perfectly. This is a Schwarzschild here and a sphere here. Then a Schwarzschild here and a sphere here. And it works perfectly well. Uh, now there is something fun going on here. If we live in a completely Newtonian world, then um, putting a void here and an overhead feature uh, here yes. does not change the. Okay, uh, change now the I understand. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> it is possible. Yeah. Uh, this, if, if we live in a Newtonian world, then all we have done here would be just taking a part, part of the mass of this body and putting it into a, squeezing it into a small sphere, but this would not affect the total mass of that. But it turns out that because GR is not, not linear, this is no longer the case. And in fact, after this operation, the total mass, which, which, by which I understand this is the integral of the density sphere, is larger than it used to be. Yeah, because this is a recursive construction at on each level of this construction, you don't touch the data which is uh, which are outside only you change something something inside yes and this is possible yeah. mm -hmm. and the funny thing and, and of course uh, the, this correction is proportional to the g times the mass of the over dense region divided by the size of this over dense region so once again this is a relativistic effect so it's proportional to this thing here mm -hmm. so we can expect that if these <coughs> points are large with us compared, as compared to their mass this will be a small effect but I will, assume, I will assume something more about that. Namely, I assume that uh, 1 over the surface area of this body uh, multiplied by the derivative of the area with respect to a normal vector uh, right here on the surface of this big body is equal to the same uh, combination on each of these smaller, smaller spheres here. This may look like a bit of a mysterious condition, but it's very important because if it is satisfied, then it turns out that the, uh, that the cap of a free sphere which we have here is exactly homothetic to the spheres right here. So it's an additional condition. But are you allowed to, uh, to uh, add this condition? Yes. Because yes. not uh, because. Uh, Yes, uh -huh. I am allowed to so I am allowed to describe understand. the size. Again, because I had an impression that now I am understanding. Okay, I go to the next slide and everything will become clear. Okay, the thing the thing is that no, but, but on the, every level, on each level, you impose two conditions uh, on the at the okay. boundary. And okay. you are no longer free to I change. Suppose, them. I suppose this will just uh, make everything much more clear. So this is the charge of method which at constant time t looks like a paraboloid. I have suppressed one dimension, so every sphere here is in fact a, uh, every, every circle here is just a sphere. And then, uh, it's well known that the structure metric at, in, with, for, for the appropriate choice of, of constant time looks like a paraboloid. Then, I cut this paraboloid right here, and I obtain a funnel. And then, I fit, fit onto this funnel, I fit a cap. By a cap, I mean a, a, a slice of a sphere. And I try to fit it in such a way that the radius here matches and also that the derivative matches. Mm -hmm. So this is, a, this is a perfect match this way. This, this way I get the Q0, the first, the first one here, with constant density here and no, no matter here. And then I glue a number of panels right here, also trying to make sure that the uh, that the derivative, that, that this thing here does not have a king, that it is continuous. Mm -hmm. And then I cut these panels in a specifically chosen places, because still I'm, I'm, free, I'm free to choose the radius of these, of these small things here. And using this last... Yeah, yeah, the only freedom you have is the position and... Uh, uh, no, I, I can choose the The size of, the, of those cuts, because otherwise the Everything is fixed by, by this boundary exactly. condition. But there is one size of these caps in which they become completely homothetic to, the, to this one. 
You see, it's all these three caps are, are positioned specifically to ensure that this thing is exactly similar to this one. It is the same. It is the same. Okay, it represents the same angle, uh, the same uh, solid angle as this one. I hope this is not more clear. Yeah, I think it would help if you would. Uh, also say that you are solving a partial differential equation of course yes which is nonlinear yes and the solution of this partial differential equation uh, allows for such a solution and this is why the main solution is perfect yeah, yeah but roughly speaking at each level of this construction you uh, a priori you de decide where uh, is this say center or, or the puncture yes. and which is the what what is the size of the size of yeah and now you see. try to convince us that you may uh, choose those parameters which a priori are free in such a way that the resulting uh, object fulfills okay. your additional so there is there is there are three things i choose i choose the size of this funnel here yes uh, the position the of position the center, center is, but in that, but that's relevant mark. because this is a sphere. Wherever I put these panels, it doesn't matter because it's a perfect sphere. And then I'm the also allowed to choose the size of this of this cap. The size. distances between these yes. things uh -huh. are important. In other words, the density of these points on the surface yeah. is, is crucial. Uh, so you, 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 you're the scratchy. <laughs> It's, in a certain sense, it's very trivial to say if you think about the physics of it. You have a sphere yes. on which you paint a point, a, yes. a rings. Right. And the rings are characterized by a position of a center right. and the radius. Yes. And the question, you know, all of this mambo jumbo of general relativity is that you are specifying the distribution function. Yeah. Of the radiuses and positions of this, and that must fulfill a certain no. condition. No. But there is a, a, an additional parameter which, at least, I forgot, and now he reminds me. There is additional parameter, namely, how big is the, this uh, this uh, the sphere, this internal sphere which contains, because it is always the. the, the uh, Construction is the following: you choose a point on something which is homogeneous, you take a, a radius R, but then you add an interior radius which you fill with rho. So in fact, you have three parameters related with so each, each puncture. So and in now each size of, 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 uh, of a block, you have the jellyfishes, which yeah. have a heart and the, yeah. and the, yeah. and the yeah. outer region. <laughs> Yeah. But the, 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 the whole discussion is about the distribution function. And since the sphere has a finite surface, then this, there is a constraint on the distribution function of how, more, how many of those jellyfishes you can put there. Yeah, but in this, uh, no, no, this, no, no, this, priori, this priori, priori, I believe there is no restriction. Because there is no restriction for the size. Yeah, there is no restriction. But yeah. I add one. I add one because I demand these caps to be. Yeah, but if you want to see the solution to this F ring between this solid sphere and this. Uh, it's a Schwarzschild solution. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a kind of a Schwarzschild solution. It's a Schwarzschild but I can't. To match the existing external. Solution, but and okay. I believe that it is, yeah. it is possible. In other words, we are discussing in the words the distribution of this. Yeah. Yes, but, but it's absolutely not true. So the, the only point I have is that I'm not matching that because this I can imagine, but the matching with the overall solution, which is other outside, outside so yeah. very far. This part. Uh, no, no, there is no, 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 there is no. no once you fulfill the, this. Um, <laughs> A boundary condition. I mean, this, is this, this is this one. This is this one. solution which is the peak. That the is the no, it's a different it one. It is a different one. Okay, so, 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 this is, so this is my point. So that you have somehow. The question is so how to, to fill the Schwarzschild. How to fill the Schwarzschild. Marek, it's a question how to fill a big Schwarzschild. Exactly. With a small shark, exactly. with a small shark, exactly. shark without So this is what the problem, because that they can and the match is here in this, yeah. to this empty ring, some spots, so I do not have a problem with that. Could we organize this discussion somehow? Kiosk, you want to say something. In this, during this construction, 
always exterior is fixed and yeah. you don't touch it, you change on the interior. Now the claim is, and I support this claim, that you may always fulfill those matching conditions and you still have three free parameters at each uh, step of this construction. Now, what I don't understand fully, but because there is such a huge uh, freedom here, because you may put all those punctures with three free parameters, now uh, Mikolai wants to convince us that his uh, additional uh, condition may be fulfilled. And this I it's don't like understand fully, it's however, it's Okay. It's, it's a condition for the size of this uh, sphere. It's like uh, I could write down exactly the matching conditions, but they're simply very big. And no, no, no. So we will leave this. Okay. So this is. But it's, it's, it's very easy easy that it's possible. You really try to understand this. In a sense, I believe that because there are so many parameters. Okay. So yeah. I okay. Okay. It. It is, uh, perhaps you could try to understand this on this picture. You cut, you cut this thing here. You get a funnel, and you fit a cap. Yes, sure. Then Just you, like you uh, add a, a number of funnels whose size and, and other parameters are again carefully chosen, and then you can cut each of these funnels in an appropriate place. You are free to, to choose where you do that. Uh, the thing is that you want to cover these funnels with caps, and you want to make sure that the caps you have here are from the same solid angle as the cup. Exactly. So they, they, they yeah. pick up the solution which was at the very yeah, beginning. They can have right. any solid yeah. angle. Yeah. This so is the problem. Okay, he is right. right. So you, you can choose the yes. Okay. No, yes, yeah. can yes. 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 He is right because oh, it's exterior, which means the left hand side of this additional is uh, right. already fixed. Yes. And you just try to uh, fulfill it at each level of this pattern. Like it problem. was exactly my problem. I now understand. There's one condition at each puncture you have yeah. one condition for three parameters which I believe may be full. Sure. Okay. okay. And then the thing is that if these things are homotopic to this one, you can repeat these constructions at the level of these new guys. Huh? And get the same pattern right here. Uh -huh. And of course yeah. these guys are again homotopic to this the one we started ah. and we can do it again yeah, yeah, and again. Ah. I don't want to go to infinity, but you can go to as large as you want. Well. As so, large as the computer. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 a weird combination of voids and overdense regions, uh, but carefully chosen in such a way that there is some kind of, kind of self similarity here. Uh -huh. Okay. So this thing belongs to the so-called Swiss cheese class of solutions. Uh, this is not my discovery that you can do this magic. It was known since 1940s, I think. Uh, but it's my idea to do it this way. In fact, there are many generalizations of this construction. You, you get so-called Swiss cheese solutions in which you have the constant density and you match it to non-constant but uh, spherical symmetric densities. And uh, there are hundreds of papers <coughs> of this type of solutions because they're very fun to study. Also, because you can they are very good to study because if you assume that this matter here has no pressure, it's just dust, then you can solve the evolution of this thing in time exactly uh, up to the time of, of recollapse. Because this thing is steady at the moment, at, at a given constant of time, but then of course it starts to recollapse. But you can exactly study this recollapse if, you're, if you are interested. Uh, it's just, it's, it's not what I do here, but you can do it in principle. Okay, what is this construction parameterized by? Well, I am free to choose the radius of, of this initial sphere, the density of matter here. I can also choose the sizes and the positions of these initial voids, and I will parameterize them again by a dimensionless thing, that is the volume occupied by each of these uh, things I have to put out of, of my sphere, divided by the total volume of the sphere. And of course, I can stop this construction after n steps. So there is also an n here. Uh, out of these things, you can again uh, get the, this epsilon parameter, which measures the non-relativistic effects. Uh, this time, you need to divide mass by r, which means, roughly speaking, multiplying rho by r squared. What is the n? It is the amount of, uh, of steps those you have to bubbles no. or the no, 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 amount the, of the, the, the level, hierarchy? The How level of hierarchy. Is the hierarchy? Yes. Yes. And finally, a very important thing. 
despite this thing possessing many uh, over and under this regions and being spared uh, so, so all these constructions not visible outside this is what, what uh, Professor Kioski noticed uh, in fact all of these steps have no influence whatsoever to the solution outside, outside this body so they do not change the ADM mass the mass we measure very far away of this, of this thing here they do change on both the mass understood as the integral of the densities this is sort of counterintuitive that such a, a asymmetric solution still produces a symmetric, yes. spherical symmetric yes. result. Uh, that's yes, that's, that's, that's right. And, and this is true for any distribution of these uh, subdense regions? Uh, so you are free to put them wherever you want to. No, no, you have to, to do it uh, carefully. No, 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 it's okay. You can match the, the distribution. If you satisfy the symmetric conditions, then yes. But of course, this means that the distribution of, of, of the density is, is chosen very carefully. We are not free to choose the density here. It is fixed. Mm -hmm. It is fixed here by, by the positions of these guys and the sizes of the bodies. Would that be much simpler if you had some symmetry that all the masses would be the same inside? Uh, I don't it, believe it. It would be very much simpler. I Moreover, I cannot. I cannot. Okay, let's let's go. Okay. But that, that's well said, it's no. one thing. No, no. Relativity is so, not linear anymore, so you don't have exactly the Gauss law. Yeah. So the yeah. fact that this can be satisfied no, is no, not that. Another has thought, I, did it as, I have done it as well, in the direction of this uh, linear limit. So does yeah. it make sense in the linear limit? Yes, in the, the linear limit, it's exactly it's compensating the, the lack of, of uh, <laughs> charge here by larger charge here, and then doing this over and over again. <laughs> But we, are not, we don't do it in completely linear GR. And this means that the total mass understood as the integral of, of these masses is not equal to the ADM mass. So there is a number of corrections. The first is the one I discussed before. Whenever you have a blob of matter, then the, this integral is not equal to the ADM mass. So there is the first correction. But on top of that, each of these levels brings some new corrections. Delta M, delta M, and delta M. And the beauty of this construction is that uh, you can sum this, this series very easily because of the self-similarity of this, this, this thing here. Uh, namely, delta m1 is given by a very complicated function of these parameters times the total mass. So in a way, you, add, you always add a fixed uh, percent of, 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 of the mass by, by doing this construction. And the fact that it is fixed is due to, to your uh, self symmetry additional and due to the self symmetry uh, delta m yeah, so the power k you add delta times m tot times the power k to minus one of the of dimensional coefficient so thanks to the self similarity this is a harmonic series mm -hmm. that's 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 the whole so the self similarity does two things first of all all it helps uh, to convince you that you can repeat this construction over and over again because you are doing basically the same thing but with state but also it helps you to sum up this series because this becomes a harmonic series I, I don't understand the, the, the first uh, your, your remark because I believe that the, without this additional condition the construction goes equally well well yes that's true, it doesn't look that nice but, but this is rather a trick to get some uh, to be able to, to sum this some have some this uh, those uh, additional terms in this these additional way. terms are for a harmonic series you can believe that because there is obviously a scale here and it's just a question of getting the scale right? yeah to sum the series you need a certain relation between coefficients right? yes 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 because otherwise there is not they are not related and so this additional condition just is a mm -hmm. this is computational a very, trick to, to this data is a very ugly function of these things but the thing is that once again it can be expressed by it can be expressed in <coughs> the linear limit by by the by the epsilon which is g mm -hmm. rho r squared so is the geometric series always convergent or no? No, it's not always convergent. It depends on, on this large parameter gamma. Yeah. Oh, sorry. 
uh, which is equal to 1 plus delta. Delta is, 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 is this correction here. And sum of alpha i's, where alpha i's are the fractions of the volume taken up by these points at each step. So this is the interesting situation when it diverges. In fact, what fact, is the physical interpretation of that? In fact, it's interesting whenever gamma is close to 1. Uh, uh, so, uh, first of all, I do not want to go to the n equal to infinity limit because you don't get, for example, because you get infinite curvature in many points. So you'd have to kick out an infinite number of points of your solution because the curvature diverges there. And keep in mind that each of these smaller spheres have larger and larger curvature. Yes, but getting very close already shows you that something is blowing up. Yes, so, so there, there's obviously a blow up if you want to go to n infinity limit. But I want to keep n finite, and then this is just okay. a, a, a Is this logarithmic divergent or...? No, 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 it's, it's a harmonic series which, which, which has, which has uh, the gamma either smaller or larger than 1. If it's larger than 1, then it diverges. The thing is that... Uh, so, so this is the general form of the total mass of this thing after n steps of the construction, so called the ABM mass, plus this correction which is due to the fact that this is just a, a block of matter, plus this, this correction, which is right here. And now, uh, I want to do something very special. I want to play with the initial parameters. First of all, I want to take, make gamma... Okay, first of all, I want to make this, uh, this configuration as Newtonian or as unrelativistic as possible. Which simply means that I choose the radius and the density initially in such a way that this epsilon is very small. And it turns out that, we can, again, because of the self-similarity, uh, all of these corrections which, which are here uh, will be very small. Because this is, in a way, a very non-relativistic void and very non-relativistic over-dense region. It does not produce a large relativistic correction. Uh, and in this case, this guy is like bootable compared to the ADM mass, this, this, this first correction is very small, and secondly, this delta parameter is also much smaller than 1. So each step brings very small corrections. But at the same time, I want gamma to be very close to 1, or perhaps even equal to 1, which means that I need to make sure that these voids take up a very large fraction of this initial sphere, uh, well, you can't eat up everything, but you can. You need to eat up a, a very large fraction just to make this gamma close to one. Because delta, delta is very small, so in order for this vector to be close to one, this one must be close to one too. Uh, you can do it. I will show later how exactly you do it. Uh, and I want to take a suitably large n. And in this case, uh, this thing simplifies to the total mass at level n is equal to the ADM mass. 1 plus, now delta is very small because this is a very non-relativistic configuration. Alpha is close to 1, gamma is close to 1, and then we have n here. And the trick is that if we take sufficiently large n, we can make this part very large. So, so we get a very paradoxical, so, so we can make this guy as large as we want just by nesting the structure one into another. Uh, just a side remark, how, how, how do you make sure that this, this is close to 1? Uh, we need to eat up, at, at the first step we need to eat up as large fraction of this volume as possible. And this is basically how you do it. You need to nest spheres inside spheres inside spheres, keep making sure that they touch each other. Uh, I did not invent this thing, by the way. In the case of 2D, this, is, this has been described by a mathematician from the 3rd century BC. And in the case of spheres, I think it was Descartes who described how to, how to fill a sphere with tangent spheres. It is by, by itself a very interesting thing, how, how, to, how to get this the radii and, and the position of the spheres, but this is not <laughs> All I am saying is that you can make sure that at the first step, uh, these volumes occupy as large a fraction of the initial volume as we want. And that's very good. And then, of course, in the first step, I put in over these regions right here, making sure that each of these uh, caps, each of these sections of, of a free center. This beautiful symmetry that I wanted to see uh, at the very beginning. This is yeah. Uh, so, and this is only because you start with three. 
at the beginning, large spheres. Yes, yeah, I started with three, but now, I, but of course, I can I can view as many as I want. At yeah, but if you could start with five, for instance, you get another pattern because. Yes. Uh, there is a fixed number. You have to start with three. I have to. You have to start with three because the point is that okay, in four dimension, you have to start start with four spheres. <coughs> the thing is that you can, if you have four spheres which are tangent to each other, then there is always a sphere which is tangent to. Uh, each okay. subsection. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a if, you, if you have three, three circles, you can find yes. a circle which is tangent to them. If you have this circle, this circle, and this circle, you can find one. Yeah, yeah that, that looks very much like, like, like a bubble. Okay, I put this thing with over the switches. And of course, later I repeat this construction here and, and here and here. I did not, I did not manage to find all of, all of the structure here because I'm already generating this in, in Mathematica to me something like half an hour. Uh, but I, I wasn't doing this very efficiently. I'm sure you can do it much better. OK. And here, uh, let me recap the paradoxical properties of this thing. Uh, so this, this, is, this is basically a, a ball of, of, of matter, let's say dust, uh, which outside looks pretty binocular. It's just a ball with, with a given mass, and this mass is in fact relatively small to its radius. So it looks like something very weak relativistic. Inside, if you look very carefully, you see a pattern of voids and over the switches. Uh, but again, whenever you, at every scale you, you, you look at, this is so similar. So you only see, again, very weak relativistic structure. Again, this parameter epsilon for each of these voids, for each of these over the switches, is very small by itself. So it seems at first sight that this should be very easily described by Linear's theory, which is in, in this case the Poisson equation of Newton's theory. So what follows from Gauss now, the total mass of this thing should be equal basically to the, the, the mass of this thing measured somewhere power here should be equal to the integral of masses, uh, to the integral of the density here. But it turns out that you can make the discrepancy between these two things as large as you want. So even though this looks extremely unrelativistic, the effect of non-relativity of GR can be made as large as we want. Why is it so? This looks a bit paradoxical. How do you resolve this paradox? Uh, the explanation is that in order to make a genuine comparison between the ADM mass, the mass measured far away, and the total mass, you have, you have to get rid of the spine structure. And as we get rid of the spine structure level by level, <coughs> as we perform the coarse graining of this model, by coarse graining I exactly mean the removing of fine structure from the from the field, which is the metric, and from the matter distribution at the same time. Uh, we need to <coughs> introduce a small correction because we know that GR is not perfectly linear. Of course, this correction will be extremely small. But the thing is that we have to make a lot of these steps to get from the uh, from the end solution all the way to this, to this ball here. And since this effect tends to accumulate order by order, uh, if we have a, a lot of that is nested structure, this effect can accumulate to something very big. Uh, OK, let's, let's try to look at this situation in terms of dimensionless parameters. So of course, we've got our dimensionless parameter epsilon, the combination of the density, the size of this, and the size of this thing here. Uh, and as we remember, uh, this uh, mass deficit in, in simple situations was simply a, a, fr a, a function of this parameter epsilon, which measures how relativistic the, the, uh, the configuration is. But here we've got another dimensionless parameter. So you might try to argue by noticing that epsilon is very small, that this must be, very, this must be a non-relativistic object, and that these corrections must be small. But this is wrong, because there's another parameter in play. And this parameter is something I call the depth of structure, which is basically the uh, ratio between the homogeneity, uh, homogeneity scale, the scale of, 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 of this, which is in this case simply the scale of, 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 of this initial mm -hmm. ball of matter, and the scale of the small ripples which appear here, in fact, the smallest ripples here. And the thing is, uh, if you, if you perform this expansion again, in our case, it turns out that x is proportional with some kind of constant here to epsilon, but epsilon is multiplied by b. 
And here's the thing. Epsilon may be as small as we want, but it, the smallest yeah. can be always compensated by... It's interesting where this logarithm comes from. Uh, from n. So what appears here, at least if gamma is equal to 1... No, no, no it's okay. From Just, I don't want to see exactly, but it looks like kind of logar uh, renormalization group. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. absolutely, yes. And we, and my, my, I'll be happy to keep the talking about this. It's absolutely good. You can look at this from the point of view of renormalization group. Uh, I don't want to do it because I don't have much more time. The bottom line is that uh, smallest of epsilon can always be compensated by large D. Uh, let me just say that the object does not have to be exactly set similar to give this effect. Uh, it's enough that it has a lot of nested structure, but the structure does not have to be exactly self similar. Self similar just helps the calculations. You, you yeah. can sum up this series very easily. Uh, of course, this shows that the uh, correct approach, if you have a complicated nested structure, also in general relativity, is to, uh, is to uh, Try to use uh, successive coarse grain, getting rid of, of, of structure on large and larger scales uh, until you, you hit the homogeneity scale. And only after you do it using an uh, exact approach, you can be sure whether the relativistic corrections are small or large. Otherwise, it can be very wrong. Uh, let me just say that there is no nested structure, and coarse grain does not produce significant uh, effects. Unless we are already in the relativistic regime, and this was the topic of my previous paper, in fact, in a way. Uh, let me just make a bit of a advertisement. This paper was chosen as uh, a highlight of classical quantum gravity and advertised on their web page. Uh, let me note that this type of nested structure is, in fact, important in cosmology and astrophysics. Uh, in fact, if we look at, 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 the, at the universe as it is now, uh, cosmologists tend to uh, discover more and more nested complicated structures and it would be very interesting to see whether these type of GR effects don't play a role here because there is a room for, uh, for this type of effect. <coughs> and nonlinear addition of masses is not the only nonlinear effect of GR. In fact, there can be other <coughs> additional pressure terms arising due to gravitation, nonlinearity of gravitation, and so on and so on. Let me at the end give a comment on a very well-known paper by two, by a known relativist, Robert Wolf and Akihira Ishibashi. Uh, this paper, in a way, ended a very important discussion which took part between 2004 and 2006. And the question was whether we need uh, sophisticated GR in cosmology or whether we can understand only in homogeneities in the universe just by taking the Friedman solution and doing the first and perhaps second order perturbation around it. Uh, the problem was whether the acceleration of expansion of the universe could be perhaps somehow uh, explained by these nonlinear terms. It was an interesting discussion, but it was basically ended by this paper, where they, the authors ended by a simple note. It is simply not possible that the cosmic acceleration, or in fact any nonlinear effects, uh, could, could come from the back reaction effect of, homog of homogeneities in our universe. Vibration effects are exactly these nonlinear effects of GR, but applied to cosmology. Uh, the authors point out that the universe appears to be described very accurately at all scales, but we can only perturb FLW. And this assertion is entirely consistent with the fact that uh, the density contrast can be, in fact, extremely large. And if it is accurately described by Newtonian perturbations, then there is simply no room for large uh, first and second order effects. And I think I've managed to convince you already that this is a very risky statement. Because it is possible that the structure you're looking at at all scales is very Newtonian, but nevertheless, you do get a large second order uh, effect. Simply, the structure is nested on many, many levels. So, uh, if I write a, up a paper about this, I will surely make a comment on, on relation to this to the Wolf's argument here. At the end of the day, let me just make a connection between what I did and the rest of the universe. So if you look at the cosmic structure outside, it turns out that we discovered that uh, the structure is quite homogeneous. In fact, what we see on the largest level, level are voids, uh, the void of any visible matter, walls of matter between them. These walls in turn are made out of filaments and large quasar groups. 
which are in, in fact made of galaxy clusters, which are made of galaxies, which are made of stars, and so on and so on. So there is quite a lot of nested structure, not so similar but nested. So let's play with numbers. Uh, what is the homogeneity scale for the universe? This is a very controversial topic because the more cosmologists look at the universe, the larger structures they discover. Let me just say that the last discovery of large structure, which is not uncontroversial, is the discovery of so-called huge LPG. LPG stands for the large, for large quasar group. Uh, and its size is approximately 10 to 9 parsecs. It's a group of quasars which extends quite far away, uh, quite far in the sky. This is the, the, the estimate of its size. So I would say that this is the homogeneity scale in the universe as we understand it today. Although there are reports of things, larger things, but they're, they're, they're a bit controversial at the moment. Then, what is the scale of the smallest structure in the universe? This is difficult to say. Let me just say that since these things are ultimately made of galaxies... I would say from Borsal to Prusha. That's also the scale in the universe. <laughs> okay, but let me say this way. Uh, we know that GR is very... No, they have the distance of all of Let me say this way. Uh, since, these, uh, since the galaxies are made of stars, and uh, at the level of stars we know that the, 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 universe, the, the, the GR can be well described by Newtonian uh, physics, Let's take the distance between stars, the average distance between stars and galaxies as, as the measure of the smallest possible scale. And then the depth of structure you get from this is equal to 20. This is, of course, not a very good number, but still keep in mind that your simple minded guess for the size of the uh, nonlinear uh, terms here can be, in fact, multiplied by 20 just because the structure is massive. So perhaps we should be more careful when... So this is not a terribly big number, but still it's something perhaps we should look more carefully at. And it may well be that relativity, general relativity nonlinear effects are something we must uh, look carefully at if we want to estimate, uh, for example, cosmological parameters very accurately. Okay, that was my last statement on this, in this talk. Uh, I just presented a very interesting object which is made of dust and contains deep nested structure of voids and overdose regions. It looks very non-relativistic, but nevertheless it has a large net nonlinear effects of GR. And this of course raises the question whether we need to take into account the effects of nonlinear effects of GR and cause gradient in cosmology and astrophysics, since you also notice certain types of nested structures there as well. And it seems that this structure is very Newtonian, but this, this statement can be quite misleading. Currently, I'm working on a general cost gradient formalism in general relativity, and in fact, it is working more or less according to the uh, principle of, of uh, renormalization group. I'd be happy to say something about it, but this is at a rather early stage at the moment. Thank you very much. Why did you stop at one parsec? Actually, at least uh, forgetting for the moment the problem of dark matter, uh, everything is made, as far as visible matter is concerned, from nuclei. This is where the mass rests. Yeah. So we have nuclei, and if you extend your uh, self-similar yeah. construction, then you get something much yeah. larger than the And the nuclei are made of more. The smallest. Yes. So we can go even further. Even further. So, so even for the Earth, yeah. there is an interesting thing because Earth is basically pure void. Yeah. And the nuclear. But from time hard. to time, you just <laughs> find the nuclear. Did you try to, to extend this to the atomic and nuclear scale? Uh, no, the problem is that uh, if you look at more complicated structures, then this X has the form of D, the depth of structure, minus an average of epsilon over many scales. So in a way, you have to, you have to go really physically from all the way from your smallest scale. But this epsilon is yeah. 10 to minus 9. So what does it mean if you multiply it by, I don't know, uh, 50. even 50? Excuse me, 100. It's 10 to minus 9 only in one object I, I mentioned. Uh, if you look at the larger structures in the universe, uh, there is a main problem. We don't, we don't know how to measure their masses correctly. 
Uh, in Earth, this is very small, but keep in mind that from, from the size of Earth all the way to this cosmological scale, there's a lot of other structures, and I'm not that, quite sure if this that, is really that small. Uh, there, there, I mean, concerning this question, how there is a paper by Walter Turing on organization of matter, which starts of what is the probability that the objects are formed, and he uses a percolation theory saying that the, the lumps of matter we observe with our for example, they are basically the lumps of matter. <laughs> and whether they can be percolated from a, a sample of a nuclei, I don't remember where they are also apart. And this... Uh, but the question is, can one uh, apply general no. relativity to yeah, the gravitational fields produced by nuclei? No, I don't think this is the right. The, the, the scale must be somewhere where we are sure that the Newtonian approximation is correct. The epsilon for nucleus is probably much, much smaller. Uh, to minus but also, so, so if you multiply even by 1,000, it is still this paper, minus 8. This paper, Nicola, I quoted. Even if you add 20 orders of minus, the value is 20. It's simply based on the observation, empirical yeah, find that computer simulations will generate those uh, images so similar to the distribution of matter in the universe, they run on Newtonian gravity approximation, or maybe first order correction. I remember I had a similar discussion with an expert, why you don't see in simulating the creation of structure in the universe, why, why don't you see any significant general relativity theory uh, effects. And he said, well, because the codes which run on the approximate, on Newtonian approximation do the job very well. So this, uh, so this non-linearities non are never visible in the, our understanding. The question is, the question is how, and this might which be Which code was the great contribution to understand because yeah, certainly this large logarithm would have to be effectively taken into account. This would give a much better solution than just neglecting that. So obviously to answer this question with full certainty, you need to make um, less... Uh, and he, with, not with one of but in four. He needs another fellowship from the foundation, but what is that? But yes, you're right. Most you of these codes are Italian or, or uh, Postman Universe plus. Uh, certain corrections. So that, that's, that's true, that's a well known fact. So they, 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 they are designed to miss these effects, in fact. And the fact that they don't see it is not a big surprise. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.